Hi, everyone. This is the uh, Canadian Foreign Policy Hour, and I'm uh, uh, coming to you from uh, Algonquin Territory. Hi, everyone. And this is the uh, Canadian Foreign Policy Hour. And um, uh, sorry, I'm uh, a little, maybe a little scattered uh, in this uh, in this uh, a session because uh, Dimitri Lascaris, Tamara Lawrence, myself, just uh, just uh, uh, told Canadian Ambassador Bob Ray uh, that he is a uh, he is a deceptive individual and that he is. Uh, supporting imperialism in Haiti, and I challenged him on Canada's voting against the uh, UN um, resolutions on Palestine, upholding international law on Palestine, uh, their recent vote against the resolution condemning neo-Nazism, resolution uh, supporting the Treaty on the Prohibition of uh, Nuclear Weapons, and uh, opposing resolution on the uh, um, uh, uh, a more just uh, economic order. And I actually had to run over here. I'm actually at a pizza pizza uh, on Elgin Street. Uh, and I have an event that we're, Dimitri, Tamara, and myself are doing at 7.30 uh, later on this evening here in uh, in Ottawa. Um, anyway, so it was a, it was quite an interesting uh, interruption of of uh, Bob Ray, but the he kept going on and on and on. I plan to I plan to interrupt him early on, but he did a whole life story before getting to the foreign policy issue. So I waited until uh, that point, and then I had to run over here. Um, so, but uh, today on this session, there's uh, lots of developments in uh, in Canadian foreign policy that are worth uh, worth talking about. I think one that's important is that a couple of days ago, Canada's ambassador at the uh, uh, to uh, Peru. Uh, Luis Marcotte, he met with the, the coup government in Peru's uh, Minister of uh, Mining. And, uh, and so while there's all this killing going on, more than 50 people now killed, mostly indigenous, uh, the, the, the Canadian ambassador thought it was a good idea to meet with this uh, usurper, usurper government's uh, a mining minister, which I think is uh, indicative of what this whole thing in Peru is about. A couple of days earlier, the U.S. ambassador met with the uh, Peruvian uh, mining, the new mining minister. Uh, so they clearly are interested in in Peru's vast mineral uh, resources. And um, I don't know if some people saw the images, but there's some the, the, the take Lima, the blockades in the most in the south and indigenous parts of the country have moved to to Lima over in recent days, and uh, there was four of Horrific images. Of, I think the oldest university, maybe or one of the oldest universities in South America. The there's a picture of a the police tank knocking down the gates so they can go and arrest hundreds and hundreds of people. But the images I saw almost entirely indigenous who were using the university. That's where they were sleeping. They had traveled like 20 hours by bus into Lima and they were sleeping at the university. There's rows and rows of these protesters handcuffed, uh, uh, lying face down. And uh, all this demonization taking place, and a couple more people were were killed uh, in, in in recent uh, days. So Canada's ambassador uh, continues to support this uh, ouster of Pedro Castillo uh, six weeks ago, and there's you know statements here and there that kind of hint at the killing that's going on, but uh, it's uh, there's no condemnation. Uh, it's it's calls for investigation and stuff like that. Um, the communication security establishment came out uh, yesterday, a day before, uh, uh, in an article in CBC saying that TikTok is uh, is is taking our taking our data, and it's it's almost comical how much this is like just following the U.S. Uh, lead. In recent weeks and months in the U.S., uh, there's been a whole campaign against TikTok. Of course, because TikTok is owned. Uh, by a Chinese company. And so now the Canadian government is targeting uh, TikTok or the communication security establishment is, is fear mongering on TikTok. In the US, it's apparently gone, got to the point where there's university campuses in a bunch of Republican states where you can't even, uh, you can't access uh, TikTok because the, the, the state has like 
ban TikTok in all public uh, buildings. So there's a story, recent story in the Wall Street Journal, I believe, that I saw saying these students, these like 19 year olds who TikTok, I guess, is a big deal for for the for the younger the younger set out there, and uh, and they can't access it on their on the you know university uh, Wi-Fi program. They have to switch their own data while on while on campus to uh, access TikTok. Clearly, this, this whole free mongering is going to come to Canada, and we're seeing that with the communication security establishment uh, fear mongering on TikTok. A couple of days ago, a maybe the most prominent, one of the most prominent dissident uh, journalists in Rwanda was killed. Uh, John William Natwali, Natwali. Uh, he apparently was like a like a car accident type thing. It's all kind of like unclear. There'd been a few. Uh, attempts on his life, what he perceived as attempts at sort of killing him by accident uh, previously, and uh, and so this this happened. Uh, uh, this is just the, the latest of a long list of examples of the the Kagame government killing all kinds of reporters, all forms of dissidents internally, of course, in, imprisoning all you know prominent dissidents uh, internally assassinating them in South Africa and Kenya and Uganda, uh, even threats in Belgium and, and actually even in Canada. Uh, and yet the Kenyan government continues to support Kagame. And even while there's another, you know, more massacres taking place in Eastern Congo by the M23, the Rwandan-backed forces, a new UN report looked into that. And still the Canadian government just continues to, to uh, you know, Kagame is a good guy. We're, we're supportive of him. They just opened up the embassy, of course, in uh, Kigali, and uh, and uh, Kagame met with Trudeau. I think five, six months ago with the Commonwealth, and he's met with Trudeau multiple times. HMCS Fredericton, Canadian naval vessel, just left for uh, on Operation uh, Reassurance. There, it's going to the Mediterranean. Uh, apparently, it's to reassure the U.S. Empire that Canada is supporting its control over the Mediterranean. And uh, this is, you know, the, the norm where there's Canadian naval vessels a little bit all around the world, be it South China Sea, be it the Mediterranean, uh, be it in the Caribbean. They are constantly patrolling the globe as if they're part of the empire's armada. And, uh, and so HMCFs just left a couple of days ago. And they talk, they talk about it as if it's targeting Russia. Maybe it is, but there's constantly Canadian naval, naval vessels in the Mediterranean targeting Iran. Uh, during the 2003 U.S. invasion of Iraq, they led Canadian naval vessels, uh, led a, a force blockading Iraq. The, 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 the Krechen government at the time actually had legal opinion saying that we were legally at war with Iraq because Canada, a Canadian naval vessel was was uh, overseeing the uh, the uh, uh, blockade, the naval blockade. Project Plowshares put out a report about Canadian arms exports uh, last year, or I guess in 2021, when the data just just came out. And they say that there was two, 81 Canada, Canadian companies sold to 81 countries, 2.73 billion dollars, which is the second highest year in Canadian uh, arms export history. Now. That $2.73 billion ignores Canada's biggest market, which is the US. So as the report points out, it's a really important point. It's something that needs to be talked about over and over again because it almost never gets mentioned. Through the, the defense production sharing arrangement, exports to the US don't even don't count. They don't even countabilize. We don't even know how many weapons are being sent to the US because it's just Canada's just treated as if it's part of the Pentagon's uh, U.S. Uh, arms industry base, right? It's just part of the arms industrial base, and so it's um, it's a uh, uh, it's scandal. Uh, it's important. It helps explain a whole bunch of elements of foreign policy, from support for NATO expansion uh, to support for you know U.S. Uh, militarism around the world. Uh, a contributor is the fact that Canadian. Arms companies are so deeply integrated with the uh, U.S. Uh, military uh, industrial uh, complex, and the report also notes that they, I think they, they say 2,484 permit uh, um, requests were put into Global Affairs Canada. It says almost all of them were agreed to, 
uh, it said about 8.2% were, were canceled, suspended, or withdrawn, and only four of the 2.4, 2,484, only four were actually rejected. So Global Affairs Canada agrees to the vast majority of export permit uh, requests uh, for uh, arms uh, exports uh, elsewhere. David Puglesi in the Ottawa Citizen has a good article titled uh, Canadian Military Finances Technology to Collect Social Media Data Despite Claims It Was Shutting Down Such Efforts. So, so the, their, the $10 million Department of National Defense uh, uh, contract around like basically social media gathering. And as Puglesi points out, the military has spied on uh, Black Lives Matter, uh, uh, has spied, he doesn't, I don't know if it's in his story, but has previously spied on Occupy, on Idol No More. And even when they say they're gonna, they're gonna back off, uh, they spend $10 million of our, of our public funds on uh, improving their methods in uh, uh, collecting uh, social media data. The, the uh, Maple has a good story uh, titled, Diplomats Warned About Israeli Politician Who Provoked Violence. Then Trudeau welcomed his government. And uh, basically, it's a story about them saying that uh, Ben Gavir, the new uh, one of the new far right ministers in Netanyahu's government, who's like a basically a sort of street thug, that that he was provoking violence. And then the the uh, uh, despite that, and by him being in the new government, despite that being reported by Canadian officials in in Israel and the Palestinian Authority that they still welcomed uh, uh, ben, the new Netanyahu government and, and, and ce celebrated it. Uh, David David Mastrisse in the passage has a very interesting story, very important story um, on uh, Erwin Kotler. And he basically does a deep dive into Erwin Kotler's claim that he was Nelson Mandela's lawyer. Now, this is a claim that Mastriche points out has just been growing and growing. The media repeats it re re regularly. Now it, he says that a search he did found 320 mentions in Canadian media, 320 mentions of uh, Kotler and uh, being Nelson Mandela's lawyer. Some of them get very ex extravagant, like Kotler like led the fight to get <laughs> to get Mandela out of prison. Now, as has been pointed out previously, the South African ambassador in Venezuela back in 2015 said that no, Erwin Kotler was not Nelson Mandela's lawyer. Similarly, it was pointed out because he was claiming that he was uh, representing uh, um, he was representing uh, the uh, far right uh, so-called prisoner prisoner uh, political prisoner. Uh, I'm totally blanking on his name. The head of the Voluntad Voluntad Popular, the the party of uh, Juan Guaido. Um, anyway, so he was rep Kotler was representing him. And uh, and kind of like making the media was re referencing Kotler as if he was he, he was he had been Mandela's lawyer and sort of giving kudos to uh, to his uh, representation of um, uh, the uh, Venezuelan uh, right wing far right uh, 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 leader. And so, uh, Mastriche deep goes deep into this and looks at like six different books. Of Mandela's biography, a number of other books, nothing mentions Kotler as being Mandela's lawyer. Then he goes through like a whole bunch, just like tons and tons of stuff. And, and he interviews Kotler. And Kotler uh, doesn't answer a whole bunch of questions. And, and it comes off that, you know, when a push comes to shove, Kotler kind of re refers to that he was asked to be the Canadian counsel for Mandela. Canadian counsel, well, Mandela wasn't in the Canadian jail. And the Canadian government wasn't like trying to arrest Mandela, though they did consider the ANC a terrorist organization at one point. Uh, so this idea of him being Canadian counsel for Mandela is, is, is farcical. And, and uh, so this story now, you could argue this is sort of like almost comes across as a bit petty. You're like, you know, looking into this ane uh, biographical anecdote of this 82-year-old former uh, uh, justice minister, Erwin Kotler. But this, this investigation, I think, is actually quite important because it goes to the heart or its heart. It, it, it speaks to the dominant media's anti-Palestinian and pro-imperialist outlook. And basically, they've gone along with Kotler 
at best, massively exaggerating, and at worst, simply lying about being uh, Mandela's lawyer. They've gone along with it because Kotler, they like Kotler's politics, to put it simply. I mean, they Kotler, there's the anti-Palestinian, obviously Kotler is a, you know, staunch uh, Jewish supremacist, staunch uh, a colonialist. Uh, must have, and also, my, my pizza is... My pizza's just been uh, delivered. So, um, and sorry again if there's any background uh, uh, um, uh, volume as well. Um, they're playing some uh, some uh, some top uh, top forty classics here. Uh, but uh, the, the the investigation goes to that the media has gone along with this Kotler fraud because it's a it's a it's a it's a, a biographical anecdote that that um, that is uh, that that that. Uh, basically, you know, adds to his adds to his profile, and and Kotler does the game of the media with regards to worthy and unworthy victims. Right? There's the the worthy victims are the ones that are the human rights violations of 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 governments that are you know enemy states, be that China, be that Iran, be that uh, Russia, and the unworthy victims are those who are killed by the U.S. empire or you know the killed by. Ken Canadian policy in Haiti, or killed by Canadian mining companies, and you'll find that Kotler never raises uh, the 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 rights violations of Canada in in uh, Haiti or mining companies or Afghanistan or Libya. And he supports he supported bombing Libya. He supports Kagame. He supports uh, ousting the government of Venezuela. He supports the thrust of Canadian imperialism. But he's this great human rights activist, apparently, because he targets. The, you know, those who are considered worthy victims of the Canadian media establishment. So the media establishment goes along with this biographical anecdote of him being Mandela's lawyer, even though I, I reached out to uh, Joanne Naiman, who was a prominent uh, a South Africa apartheid activist in the 1970s in Toronto. She wrote a book and she was in 2013, a, a Toronto Star article uh, by um, forgetting that uh, former call that mentions her as one of the main campaigners in Toronto. And her group was like close to the African National Congress, the ANC, which at that point, again, was viewed as like terroristic. And I so I reached out to her asking her about this Kotler, uh, uh, you know, business. And she's like, I, I mean, she was, she's like, she talked to her, her husband and her, she's like, I can't remember any of this. Then she reached out to, uh, to this other activist and she said, she had a better memory than her the person said it was total bullshit. Uh, that's a quote. And, uh, and so I bet you there were thousands. It's not just that Kotler wasn't actually Mandela's lawyer in Canada. There were thousands of Canadians who, who, uh, who did more to struggle against apartheid in South Africa than Kotler did. Um, and uh, anyway, so this is a very good story that Mastriche uh, uh, delved into. And, and he also, he points in the article that, you know, when we disrupted Kotler in 2019, um, some people from the Mouvement Québécois pour la paix uh, Malcolm Guy, Dimitri, uh, myself, and some others. Uh, Kotler responded to uh, our 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 our, our uh, criticizing him on on supporting Israeli apartheid, and he he's like a really indignant response of as somebody who fought against the real apartheid. This is a besmirching of the South African uh, what the South Africans had to go through. And then when you you know you find you find out that this is all just a big like uh, you know broad that he's like concocted about him being Mandela's lawyer. Um, I do hope that people investigate this a bit further. I'm of the opinion, I, I bet if you if someone interviewed the two dozen or so most uh, active organizers against uh, Canadian complicity with apartheid South Africa in the 70s, uh, uh, they'll find that none of them have any memory of Kotler engaged in any uh, 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 you know, serious uh, uh, organizing, maybe, maybe into the 1980s uh, as the issue became mainstream. Um, so this in, this investigation by uh, Mastruce, and I think maybe he has another one coming out, is a very, uh, is interesting. It's not, you know, again, it's, it comes across almost as petty, but it actually has quite massive political ramifications around the Canadian media sphere. And I should point out for anyone who's in Toronto, uh, Kotler will be uh, uh, speaking on February 5th at the launch of his uh, screening of the, his, his uh, biography. Uh, so, I, you know, I invite anyone in Toronto to, uh, 
to ask Kotler about whether he was Mandela's lawyer, ask Kotler whether he was the, uh, you know, why he uh, so anti-Palestinian, uh, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, uh, a couple of days ago, CBC Montreal uh, published this uh, very good little uh, clip, minute and a half clip about um, news channel uh, about um, a Holocaust educator in the uh, English School Board of Montreal uh, at uh, speaking to Westmount high school students. I think they were like grade nines, mid tens, I, I forget. And in this clip, they have this parent and, and, and student complaining. Because the Holocaust educator uh, is asked, I guess he, the question of Palestinian rights comes up, and he says that those who say uh, uh, Israel's treating Palestinians poorly, it's quote a bunch of crap. Trust me, they're doing everything but abusing the Palestinians. This is a Holocaust educator's crass denialism of Palestinian dispossession, which I, I consider. Uh, equal in terms of its absurdity as someone saying, you know, Hitler, Hitler didn't dislike the Jews. Uh, and quite frankly, far worse, because we're talking about not a historical denial, but a that, you know, but a denial of an ongoing injustice. So the, the consequence of this denial of Palestinian dispossession is 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 far worse than uh, uh, um, uh, someone uh, sort of denying Hitler uh, tried to exterminate uh, European Jewry. Um, now, the uh, uh, Canadians for Justice and Peace in the Middle East put out a uh, a letter, sent a letter to the English School Board, and posted it to, to Twitter. Very good. Congratulate them for doing that. But in this letter that Tom Woodley, the head of CJPME, puts a sense to the School Board, Montreal School Board. He says, quote, my organization and I heartly, heartly encourage Holocaust education in our public schools. Now, we had Norman Finkelstein on last week's session where he went through the Holocaust industry, how uh, the Nazi Holocaust is used as ideological cover for Israeli crimes uh, today. Uh, the English Montreal School Board's Holocaust Education Program was actually set up in collaboration with the Israeli Foundation. The Israeli Foundation, uh, David Israeli, who died a few years ago, he was a billionaire, like th worth like three billion before he died. He he fought in the ethnic cleansing in 1948, right? He 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 put it forward a a a, 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 a theater, I believe, in in occupied Golan Heights to commemorate the brutal Seventh Brigade. Uh, that, that ethnic cleanse of 48. He's supported like groups that are considered fascistic by the Israeli courts. Um, the Israelis paid for the Israel Studies program at Concordia and set up in 2011, the first Israel Studies at a Canadian university, I believe, the first minor maybe in Canadian Israel Studies. Um, and and at uh, uh, Steinberg, uh, Gerald Steinberg, a leading anti-Palestinian at a conference set up by the Israelis uh, in, in Montreal, a couple of years after the, the Israel Studies program set up at Concordia, Steinberg referred to it as a counterattack against pro-Palestinian activism at Concordia. Why would Canadians for Justice and the Peace in, Peace in the Middle East need to add a sentence saying that we encourage Holocaust education at, 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 uh, at uh, Montreal schools? I get it if they can't, if politically it's it's too sensitive to say you know, we discourage it. I get it. I get it. it's a very sensitive political subject, but there's no need for a pro-Palestinian group to go out of its way while the Israel lobby is pushing the International Holocaust Remem Remembrance Alliance's anti-Palestinian definition uh, of anti-Semitism all around, pushing universities, school boards, uh, all over the government. There's no need for CGPME to, to make that statement, to cred credibilize them. You know, the Nazi Holocaust is a shocking horror. It's it's almost, you know, hard to get your head around how horrific. Um, it's even, it's, it's, it's shocking that in, in 2022, 2023, a, the, this million slaughtered by far right forces in Europe, um, 
ethnic religious groups slaughtered, uh, that, that this is used against uh, the colonized Palestinians and increasingly used against the left. But that's the reality. That is just what it is. The Nazi Holocaust is, is now used against Palestinians, against progressive forces. It's shocking. It's odious. It's, but it's largely reality. Uh, and we have to face that. And, and, uh, and CJPME certainly shouldn't be uh, uh, going out of its way to uh, push that kind of uh, idea. Um, with regards to the NATO proxy war in Ukraine, Canada announced uh, that they sent 200 uh, armored vehicles uh, produced by Rochelle, Canadian company. And actually, I saw an image on Twitter today that one of them has already actually been blown up. Uh, uh, near uh, uh, in the fighting in uh, in the east, um, it, one of the things that's interesting about this delivery, I think, is like ninety million dollars that Canada spent on this, is that it's the company is founded by Roman Shimonov, who's a board member of the Canada Ukraine Chamber of Commerce, um, and so this is a group, of course, that's been pushing for you know more engagement, more weapon sent, and more sort of Canadian bombast vis-a-vis uh, -vis Russia. This is the same group that when I when I interrupted Krista Freeland about uh, two months ago in Toronto, uh, they, they, the uh, the the head of this group was talked about how uh, getting a, a piece. He actually used the word peace, a piece of the action after uh, the war had ended. And so the you know these sort of vulture kind of capitalists um, uh, already thinking about the uh, the reconstruction uh, potential reconstruction boon. But but um, so anyways, another, you know, more Canadian weapons uh, uh, sending uh, to to uh, to the fight. And and quite honestly, uh, the situation, just in my opinion, just keep, it's getting worse and worse. We're seeing escalatory dynamics all over uh, the, the stories about how many Ukrainian soldiers are being killed. The images of the destruction, obviously stories about Russians being killed. I mean, this is just. Horror, horrific, and it looks like it's just picking up the horror. Um, and and in the uh, in the uh, uh, the Globe and Mail uh, uh, three or four days ago, Michael Byers, Michael Byers ran for the NDP. He's a University of British Columbia prof. He was prominent with uh, the Rideau Institute for a number of years. I believe he was on their board. Did a, whole, did a number of reports with the Rideau Institute. He was viewed as a sort of like lefty foreign policy uh, uh, voice. And he did like a report on the F-35, uh, some Canadian uh, procurement decisions. And, and it was, you know, reports that were pushed by sort of kind of peace type groups. But if you looked at it, it, it was really like a criticism more of like, you're not buying the right equipment rather than this, you know, this is stoking militarism. It was more about like not the right equipment. And um, and Michael Byers in the Globe has a column, basically saying Canada's got to send the uh, its leopard tanks, the German leopard tanks that we have, which the, the Germans are not okaying. They have not okayed. They're they the Germans are thus far opposing. I guess there's a couple thousand of these tanks it's considered a major escalatory point. Um, the the the, the Zelensky is putting lots of pressure. On, on sending these, and the Germans are holding, saying, no, we don't want to see German-made tanks, you know, in Eastern Europe where German-made tanks have created all kinds of horrors in the past. And, and we see this as, you know, adding to escalation. And so, but you have Michael Byers with a column, with the whole point of the column is to say, we got to send the Canadian uh, uh, German-made Leopard tanks uh, to fight Russia. And so he's right alongside with um, Rick Hillier, right? Rick Hillier, you know, former head of the Canadian military who, who, who's pushing the, you know, we're going to kill the scumbags, the hardline militarist who, who uh, is now working, I think he's working for the Ukrainian Canadian Congress or another Ukrainian Canadian group pushing for more and more weapons. So you have Michael Byers and Hillier, like, you know, singing to the same tune on, on what to do. It's a really stunning comment on the state of uh, the left, anti-war activism, uh, 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 et cetera. Michael Bethrens, um, I mentioned this last 
week, but he updated his tweet uh, about Jagmeet uh, Singh and F-35 and, and saying nothing about the F-35. And he, he, t- he cites Jagmeet saying that, uh, Singh saying that, that, we have ca- that we have Canadians back. And, and, and he says that uh, basically we have the NDP as Lockheed Martin's back. Uh, on the 380 billion, that's that's what we're talking about with the fighter jets and the naval procurement support or silence from the NDP. 380 billion dollars in procurement, offensive weapons, fighter jets that can drop nuclear bombs, the F-35, uh, uh, naval vessels where they're talking about getting uh, tomahawk missiles that can shoot 1,500 kilometers, and there is support or silence. Uh, uh, from the NDP on that uh, issue. And a couple of days ago, I, I uh, uh, Heather McPherson tweeted about uh, Iran. And in her tweet, she said that she sponsored a, uh, a resolution at the Foreign Affairs Committee to list the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps as uh, a terrorist organization. To, to the whole organization is a terrorist organization. And in her statement, she's saying, like, she's putting pressure, like, you know, I sort of, I dare you liberals and conservatives to, to support my resolution. And her statement says, quote, the liberals can claim to be steadfast in their support for Iranians, but they continue to implement half measures. And this is only referring to her resolution on the uh, Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps. And this is only the first step. New Democrats will continue to push the liberal government to employ every tool at their disposal to support the Iranian people and ensure an end to the human rights violations. Does that include an invasion? Does that include more, you know, U.S.-Israeli assassinations of Iranian officials? What, What does... What is every tool that Canada has? And, and so seeing this got me thinking about like, you know, should the, should the like progressives, internationalists just call for like getting rid of the NDP foreign affairs critic? And I mean, like, you know, on domestic issues, the, the NDP, at least the federal NDP, you know, 90% or more on the issues they're not calling for more privatization in healthcare. They're not calling for more, um, you know, less daycare funding, uh, you know, more, I don't know, private schools, you know, worse labor standards uh, for the federal labor code. You can debate that. You can debate the provincial NDPs. I'll leave the provincial NDP governments aside. They're, they're, you know, that's a whole other question. But at the federal level, it's the third party. The NDP on most domestic issues, it's pretty rare where they're taking the liberals from the right. But on foreign policy, there's a lot of issues where they are taking the more belligerent, the more imperialistic, and even some cases, the more militaristic position. And I would say Iran is an example. I say, obviously, Russia, Heather McPherson, McPherson is a complete fanatic on proxy war with Russia. And that didn't begin on February 24th. That began long before that. Uh, they've been staunch proponents of Canada's eight-year uh, proxy war with Russia that dates back at a low, much, much lower level, of course, with Operation Unifier in early 2015, where Canada began uh, uh, formally training a Ukrainian force that was at war in the East against Eastern parts of the country. Of course, Russia was much less than we hear about in our media, but was providing some support for uh, the, the uh, uh, independence forces in, uh, in um, Eastern uh, uh, Ukraine. And Canada was basically in a very low level proxy war to Russia for be- between 2015 and, and right up until uh, early this uh, early last year. Now on China, also they've been very aggressive on a whole bunch of issues, from you know declaring uh, uh, the Uyghur issue a genocide to uh, 
all kinds of issues on, on, on China. So three big issues, Russia, China, Iran, where I would say it would just be better not to have an NDP foreign critic. Uh, on something like Peru, the, the coup in Peru, there's been nothing, total silence from McPherson. Uh, so I would say in a case where there's silence, it's better not to have them because, you know, you're not like sort of, it's their silence is sort of a kind of passive support, acquiescence in a certain way. So you may be better off not having them in a case where it's actually silence. Uh, on Venezuela, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure what McPherson is. Though. I can't, I don't think I've seen anything from McPherson on Venezuela, but we know that the previous NDP foreign critic, Hélène Lavadier, uh, she was a staunch, uh, she was calling like, she was calling the vice president of Venezuela a, a, a drug dealer. She came up with a wild claim, 2017 House of Commons, totally lied, just a complete fabrication that the Americans had, had taken billions, I didn't use the word, billions of dollars of his assets. And when I pushed on it, she said, basically said these right-wing Venezuelans had told her this. And so she raised it in the House of Commons. Uh, she supported Juan Guaido, uh, so on Venezuela, now NDP got a little bit better on Venezuela more recently, but on Venezuela, I don't know, is it better, would it be better to not have an NDP foreign critic? Uh, there are some issues where I would say clearly the NDP is better to have a foreign critic. Um, before getting to that in a second, I should also mention Haiti. Haiti's kind of interesting one. McPherson has come out basically opposing a foreign military intervention in Haiti in recent uh, weeks, but the NDP also supported... Oh, explicitly supported the core group, right? The core group, that's the foreign ambassadors that, that rule Haiti that appointed Ariel Henry. Uh, now on some other issues where, you know, it's better, I say on like mining, on mining on Canada's global mining behemoth, yes, the NDP is better, better to have an NDP foreign critic. On Palestine, it has become the case, particularly with Heather McPherson, where it is definitely better to have an NDP foreign critic uh, though that even is a little bit complicated, but McPherson has done some pretty good stuff on that issue uh, uh, recently. So, you know, I don't, I don't have a full answer. It's a kind of crazy question to ask, but I think you can make a case. And, you know, it's, of course, a, a very disturbing case from the standpoint of an anti-imperialist and internationalist, because you obviously want the NDP in principle, in theory, you want the NDP to be more engaged on international issues. But you can make a case that it would be better to not have an NDP foreign critic um, than, than to, to, to have one uh, for the world. The world would be better off without an NDP foreign critic. And I think that uh, certainly anybody around the NDP needs to grapple with that um, uh, possible uh, uh, reality. Um, on that note, I'll, uh, I'll open it up to uh, comments and questions. I have to be uh, hard out of here because I have an event uh, beginning at 7.30, and I got to eat my pizza. Uh, so go ahead, uh, go ahead, Phil. Yeah, on um, Peru, uh, maybe it's, it's like the, uh, you could reach out to the Yellowhead Institute. They, um, they're a faculty of arts in Toronto and deal with uh, Indigenous issues. Because I'm thinking Canada, you know, we have the Truth and Reconciliation Report, and We've just, I think if at this rate, maybe in 150 years, we might address all 94 recommendations. And uh, so it's like we pay lip service to indigenous rights here in Canada, but when it comes to like Central and South America, it's just right out colonialism and imperialism. And, you know, we signed on to UNDRIP and I would think that would mean that we have responsibility to, to advocate and protect indigenous rights across the whole world, not just in Canada, but say when we're in Latin America, we can go full colonial imperialist and genocide. You know, it's it's just a hypocrisy. Of, uh, so maybe this, the foreign policy people in this country should reach out to indigenous people in this country and see if we can have some sort of united front. Yeah, no, I, I agree. That's a great that's a great suggestion. I, I saw Russ Daibo, uh, who's a indigenous, um, policy analyst, a very important uh, figure in uh, decolonization struggles. Uh, he tweeted about uh, Peru and, and uh, 
uh, I forget the exact message, but he was framing it in that kind of context. You you mentioned uh, uh, Phil. Too. You 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 would you would think that it would be like low hanging fruit for Heather McPherson and other NDP MPs to you know sort of say, hey, are we backing mining companies at the expense of all these indigenous people being killed? You think that would be low hanging fruit? It, it would certainly go along with the rhetorical uh, claims that that they they have but but mcpherson's just unwilling to do that and she's received hundreds hundreds and hundreds of uh emails on this i've tagged her uh uh on twitter uh you know it's it's not like she's she's choosing not to do this uh which is i think just kind of quite um uh you know uh shocking really but uh but yeah i totally agree that that the yellowstone institute would actually be a good uh to reach out um to someone there to see if they, you know, if they you know, into making a statement or, or or something like that specifically around uh, UNDRIP. Go ahead, uh, Laura. Okay, this is a very quick question because I want you to eat your pizza. And I just wanted to know, like our very fun guest last week, Norman Finkelstein. So his thing is like, there's no such thing as PDS. Don't ask me about PDS. It doesn't even exist. And you have said in the past that you, you don't really see too much value in um, really promoting BDS in Canada because there's hardly anything to buy anyway or something like that. But I'm just wondering, like, you know, because I've always supported BDS and do we not see a value in BDS in that, I don't know, these things getting raised and the media clamp down that maybe that kind of stirs people a bit. They recognize that something's going, even if there isn't much of a boycott going on, you know, more, Norman's probably right. I guess I'm trying to my own mind and think through like what the value of BDS is. Yeah, I don't I don't agree with Finkelstein's uh, um, dismissal as he did uh, uh, last week. I agree with parts of it. Uh, I think that it, it, there's a couple elements that I, I'm supportive, strongly supportive of the element of the BDS movement that is not focused on like 67 borders and like Zionism became a problem in 1967. And, you know, I, 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 I'm not saying I get in, I don't, not interested in the one state, two state debate. That's not what I'm saying by saying that, but I'm saying that we should absolutely discredit a Zionism as a European imperial, uh, nationalistic Christian Zionist movement. That's what Zionism comes out of in the late 1800s. That's why it appears at that time in history, not because there was a, a you know, anti-Semitism was new in Europe. That's just not, it's not true. It's because there were political forces, political forces that I reject, the imperialistic Christian Zionist, nationalistic, uh, the height of nationalism, uh, that that that's what drove uh, Zionists. So that element, and I think BDS does more of that type of sort of uh, holistic critique than other kind of movements have tended to do. What where I'm more sympathetic to Finkelstein is, you know, I'm kind of more of the opinion is that like it's like we we're not boycotting Israel in the sense of Canada is so complicit. With with historic and today, like if we just treated Israel as a regular ally, as a regular right wing ally, like as we if we treated Israel as we treated Colombia until the recent government, you know, we have free trade agreement, we sell them weapons, you know, the, the diplomatic backing, etc. If we just treated Israel that same way, that would be a huge blow to the impunity and the racism and the colonization Palestinians are facing and Israel is uh, perpetrating. Because we're, we're providing, like, you know, we're, if you just up, upheld Canadian law on, on, with regards to Israel, specifically around recruitment of for the IDF, and most important in concrete terms, monetary terms, the whole charity question, uh, that would have a that would have a consequence. So when we talk about like not having Israeli products in Canada, I don't have I don't I certainly don't have any ideological problem against that against that. But it, it's a tactical. I think it's a tactical mistake, and it takes us away often. I can say not entirely, but often takes us away 
from from campaigns that that I think are actually uh, more consequential and in, in some cases more likely even to succeed. Um, so so uh, I think that that's uh, uh, something that that should be in mind. Now, where I think that the BDS movement has been more successful, this doesn't hold for other countries. This prob this holds for the U.S., but it doesn't hold for European countries that have more have more pro Palestinian and have more like you know Israeli oranges coming into their country and where some boycott campaigns make more sense. So I, I'm, I'm and, or Jordan or you know Arab countries or maybe some other countries that Sudan or wherever right where that where I think more a, B, a genuine BDS actually makes you know they have yeah, historically they have actually had BDS. So so I'm 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 just arguing for Canada. Um, where I do think the BDS movement has had more uh, uh, consequence is on the cultural boycott, specifically around like artists playing in Israel. And I, I think that they, I think Finkelstein is exaggerating. I mean, I think there is an element that that the Israel lobby likes to keep the BDS, the BDS boogeyman. There's an element of oh, it's you know picking on picking on the only Jewish state and this kind of dynamic that they they play into. So I think that there is some 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 element of 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 that where the Israel lobby sort of likes to kind of like big up BDS in some ways, but I do think there's also a, a a psychological toll, a cultural toll, on the Israeli public of like artists not going and playing in Israel, and it's like you know this sort of the whole normalization and you you know just a you know any normal European country that happens to be in the Middle East uh, that Israelis would like to you know sort of. Uh, pretend that I think that some of that the campaigns have had uh, uh, success on. So, so yeah, I, I don't I don't think that um, lots of elements of the BDS campaign in Canada are particularly um, uh, effective. And I'll actually I'll go one step further. I think there are people, there are groups. Uh, I'm not going to name names of groups, but the leading BDS supporters in, in Canada, like that that you know, there's people out there that that they say they they support BDS, but they they like you know basically do things with like United uh, uh, Jewish Appeal or United Jewish Federation of Toronto, right? Like that they're the the main like apartheid lobby group in Canada that sends all kinds of money to Israel that funds Sija that organizes a walk with Israel, and so like but one hand people say they support BDS, but on the other hand they're sort of they like I'm I'm okay with uh, the Jewish federations of Canada. It makes absolutely no sense. Absolutely no sense. I mean, BDS, like all the charitable donations that Canada's giving to Israel that, you know, we're subsidizing. But according to BDS, that would be illegal, not the subsidies. I mean, the donations would be illegal, right? That would be illegal. You wouldn't be allowed to like send money to Israel according to a maximalist BDS. So like, we're like so many steps away from uh, uh, that dynamic. And so I, I think that, um, there's elements of BDS that I, I, I support. And, I, you know, again, in terms of like hard line criticism of, of Israel and Zionism and what it's meant to Palestinians. Uh, tactically, I think there are lots of elements that I don't think are very helpful. Go ahead, uh, Yuri. And I think that probably, well, I'll go, I guess we'll have time for Kim, but try to keep it brief, uh, Yuri and Kim. Go ahead, Yuri. Sure, no problem. Uh, okay, then, very, you know, very quickly, you know, you were talking about. Uh, uh, Erwin Kotler and and lying about uh, him being a lawyer of uh, of uh, Mandela and uh, uh, why and why do you think the Conservative Party of uh, Canada hasn't picked up on this very big fib and 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 just for cheap politics just like you know use it to like you know like attack uh, the Liberals does that go back to the fact that Erwin Kotler is just it, because he is so popular and because he is and because he does advance the imperial order, the conservative party just goes, well, let's not really, you know, go into, you know, him lying about. Uh, when, you know, when, 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 when Mouvement Québécois pour la Paix interrupted in 2019, when we disrupted Kotler's talk at Concordia, the, a conservative MP who was uh, the ch vice chair of the Canada-Israel Interparliamentary Group sponsored a resolution in the House of Commons. To, celebrate, to condemn us and to celebrate Kotler. The Israel media, Israel, pro-Israel media said it got unanimous support in the House of Commons. 
Okay, this was just like us, like we we disrupted for like ten minutes. He got to finish his whole speech and whatever. It was like, <laughs> and the House of Commons like condemned us. Apparently, unanimous. Uh, Heather McPherson met with Kotler twice uh, at the end of last year, twice in two week period. She tweeted about it, celebrating. Had a good opportunity to, to wisdom of her own Kotler and human rights. Uh, Elizabeth May, a whole bunch of things with Kotler. Kotler's uh, Raoul Wallenberg Center set up this like uh, all, I didn't call it all parliamentary group for human rights that had like MPs from all the different uh, um, parties. He's a darling. He's a real darling of the Canadian media political establishment. And so, yeah, I agree. You would think that like some reporter, I mean, the whole question of like faking, you know, politicians faking, you know, biographies and stuff, it's a, it's very current, right? With the uh, Santos there, uh, the American Republican, the whole question of like that, you know, sort of like the pretend Indian, these academics who claim they're, you know, indigenous, this, that, this whole question is something the media has been kind of into, like investigating these kind of like scandals of these individuals, like concocting these stories to like advance their careers and all that stuff. A week after Mastriche published, or, you know, six days, I don't know what it is, I've seen no mention in the corporate media. Uh, a couple of the corporate media journalists on Twitter attacked Mr. Gise, uh for even John Iverson in the National Post, you know, right wing National Post. He, he His tweet is hilarious. He's like, uh, basically, you did an expose of Kotler. Kotler is uh, uh, equal to the Pope. Uh, uh, it's just, it is like, like you can't even like you. All you can do is have fawning coverage. You can't even like investigate the guy's claims. That's that's what, uh, John Iverson's opinion. Um, so yeah, no, the, the, this, the, the, the sort of unanimity of the imperialist Zionist media political sphere trumps any sense of getting some like, you know, uh, cheap political points on, uh, on going at, uh, uh, Kotler. Maybe if he was still, maybe if he was still uh, an actual minister, then maybe that the, 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 the political points would, would supersede, you know, what he, what he's now sort of become, which is, you know, more of this sort of like media kind of human rights figure. Uh, go ahead, uh, Kim. You'll have to forgive me because right now I'm reading Canada and the world and I'm I'm finding it so revealing and so interesting. Basically, he's talking about the colonial imagination. That's the term that he's coined, as far as I know, to kind of bring to uh, to 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 identify the idea that the world is based on a hierarchical system, a racial system of 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 class system, race system, a race a, a system of superiority of one person over the other. Essentially, the idea that we're all parts of a some kind of a towering, uh, teetering hierarchy. So this suits very well the neoliberal agenda. This suits the the agenda of the one percent. But he makes the case for historically how the entire. Canada historically has been true to that colonial imagination, the idea that we have the right to dominate certain people and to be do dominated if we're in a lower caste or whatever. So it's essentially the world caste system, if you want. So I think we have to bring this to light and call this out because BDS, I've been supporting BDS for as long as I can remember, 20 years, <laughs> you know, writing about BDS campaigns and championing, tweeting about BDS and somebody just pointed out it worked in South Africa. But I think we have to attack the underlying ideology that it keeps coming back to. And that's why it's taboo to criticize Israel, by the way, because Israel is his fellow colonizer. They're just doing what Canada has done historically and what Canada, Canadian powers that be, Canadian raison d'etre is founded on that ideal, that idea. So we have to attack that. We have to reveal that. We have to call that out over and over again, because I think if people knew People don't really understand what's really behind all this. If they knew, and if it was the empire had no clothes, maybe they would they would think differently. Maybe they wouldn't vote for the parties that they vote for. Maybe they wouldn't support the people that they support right now. That's all I have to say. I can't hear you. Uh, you you're referring to Tyler Shipley's book, so so that's uh, people can uh, check check that oh. out. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's a very important uh, kernel of a very important truth in that in the settler settler colonial states and settler solidarity and that dynamic with uh, with Zionism. And that's clearly if you go back and look at like the imagination of uh, early Canadian Zionists, often Christian Zionists, that is expressed, um, you know, not not subtly, very, very, 
very, uh, very over, overtly. All kinds of things, whole indigenous issues, all of mining, all of uh, everything Canada does in the world is, is really true to that ideology. So go go ahead, Julio. I'm gonna be brief because I, I yeah, do very really... briefly. Yeah, I just um I, I for I'm I'm part of uh, Greater Toronto for BDS. You know we're uh, we're not as active as we were, but I'm curious uh, about. Uh, you mentioned that uh, there's uh, BDS outfits that are working along with some of the uh, pro apartheid uh, outfits here in Canada. I wonder if uh, you you know. I, I, I didn't I didn't mean it. I I I'm referring to a a, a specific journalist uh that that i i don't want i don't want to get into like a whole uh um yeah naming names like that but yeah. but yeah I, I mean i guess like i don't um independent jewish voices mm -hmm. is unwilling it says it supports pds but mm -hmm. it's unwilling to challenge the federations oh i see that i see your point Thank you, Eves. So, so yeah like i i, I that's because that would be considered very like sort of you know there are people I give you are probably not gonna be happy with me saying that, but I it's I think it's a reality. And yeah, I, I I see that as like a, a very contradictory kind of dynamic where I mean, first of all, the federations they fund CJA. CJA, the main apartheid lobby group, is that's they it's the advocacy agent of the federations. Beyond that, the federations, you know, they have their walk for Israel, they send money to Israel every year, they so I feel like there's people out there, uh, many people in, in that that are sort of like they say they're pro BDS, and they basically like either ignore and in some cases even a little bit hostile to campaigns that uh, target groups that are like you know uh, actively uh, 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 promoting uh, Israeli uh, uh, apartheid. Uh, thank but, you. But uh, uh, on that note, uh, thanks everyone. Uh, same, uh, I guess maybe a different place, but uh, next week, uh, same time, uh, I guess same, uh, same virtual uh, space. Take care. Have a good night, everyone.